Okay, we'll get started. Thanks for coming today. My name is Brian Hurley. I work at uh, Rockwell Collins in Wilsonville as the Lean Six Sigma Consultant. Um, it means I do process improvement work. Um, I'm also a president of Recycling Advocates, which is a local nonprofit that works on reducing uh, waste to the landfill. And so, doing some research on one of our new campaigns, I came across a lot of studies around behavior changes and what actually works. So I wanted to share some of the things I've found and then talk about our campaign and the things we're trying to implement. And then hopefully if you guys have some thoughts or ideas or things that you've seen that works really well, I'd like to hear those from you. So with, this is a study that they did when they were looking at ways to try to encourage people to reduce their electricity usage. So I thought it was really interesting the, the findings that they had. saving message work best of all. In fact, none of these messages work. They had zero impact on energy consumption. It was if the grad students hadn't shown up at all. But there was a fourth message. And this message simply said, when surveyed, 77% of your neighbors said that they turn off their air conditioning and turn on their fans. Please join them, turn off your air conditioning and turn on your fans. And wouldn't you know it, they did. The people who received this message showed a marked decrease in energy consumption simply by being told what their neighbors were doing. So what does this tell us? Well, if something is inconvenient, even if we believe in it, moral suasion, financial incentives don't do much to move us. But social pressure, that's powerful stuff. And harnessed correctly, it can be a powerful force for good. In fact, it already is. Inspired by this insight, my friend Dan Yates and I started a company called O-Power. We built software and partnered with utility companies who wanted to help their customers save energy. We deliver personalized home energy reports that show people how their consumption compares to their neighbors in similar sized homes. Just like those effective door hangers, we have people comparing themselves to their neighbors. And then we give everyone targeted recommendations to help them save. We started with paper, we moved to a mobile application, web, and now even a controllable thermostat. And for the last five years, we've been running the largest behavioral science experiment in the world. And it's working. Ordinary homeowners and renters have saved more than $250 million on their energy bills, and we're just getting started. This year alone, in partnership with more than 80 utilities in six countries, we're gonna generate another two terawatt hours of electricity savings. Now, the energy geeks in the room know two terawatt hours, but for the rest of us, two terawatt hours is more than enough energy to power every home in St. Louis and Salt Lake City combined for more than a year. Two terawatt Okay, so appealing to people about it's good for the environment, it's gonna save you money, that doesn't seem to work as, as well as we think it does. And so it's pretty interesting that getting people to talk about what is everyone else doing and how am I different or unusual Actually, actually moves the needle and actually gets people to take action and do something different. So that that was one thing that was pretty eye-opening. So let's take that concept and look at a study that was done on hotel tower reuse. So if you go to a hotel, you see the sign that says, you know, please put your towel on the floor if you want us to pick it up and replace it, or hang it up if you want to keep it and reuse it again. And so they did this study. There was uh, 53 days and 15 or 1,600 times where they changed out the room. And they, took, they kept track of how people responded to that and how many towels they used, how many they uh, left on the ground. So they tried different types of towels, or sorry, different types of messages to see which one would work better. So these are the different uh, options they put in the rooms. And you can see some are longer than others. And I highlighted in red which ones were um, changes from one to one. So like the first one is just very simple, you know, have respect for nature, um, save the environment, and reuse your towels. 
Then they add a little bit more detail with some, dat some data. It says 75% of the guests participated in the new resource savings program. Then they added one that says 75% of the people who stayed in this room, and they customize it for each room number. Here they, they touch on fellow citizens. Here they talked about men and women and break out the difference between men and women. So which one do you think did the best of those five? One, two, three, four, five. Two. Number two? Okay, why is that? Uh, targeting the atmosphere, uh, the localized, so targeting the hotel guests. The guests, directly. Okay. Any other thoughts or ideas? You think number five? Okay. Because it broke it out by the gender, Rip. Okay. Three or five? Okay. Why do you think three? The, the room itself. Okay. So let's see what the result is. <laughs> so 38% is kind of like the, uh, the default one. That's pretty generic. And most hotels I've stayed at, that's the you know, very simple message. Um, all the other ones uh, were statistically higher, so they were an improvement. It's you know four, five, ten percent higher, but it is um, based on all that data. It was a difference. So even a little percentage here or there of improvement based on the wording was really effective. And yeah, that was exactly it. That they got it down to that specific room and says guests who stay in this room do this behavior, and it kind of reinforces that. So very interesting that. Uh, just how specific you get can be a difference in, in what kind of behaviors you will, um, people will actually change. Here's another video that I like, and this is gonna go through a methodology called influencer model, if anyone is familiar with that. But it's a really good summary of that, and then what I'm gonna do is talk about how the different elements of this model apply to a campaign we're working on. What you're about to see is real kids real things. Just thought you should know. My name's Hiram Dirk, and I was there for the whole thing. So here's a question. What does it take to get people to change? And I'm not talking about their socks and underwear, but change behavior, especially when it's hard. For example, Every year, close to 100,000 people die from hospital-acquired infections. That means people got sick at the hospital. And it turns out, one of the main culprits is hand hygiene. That means just getting people to wash their hands could save lives. So my crack research team decided to conduct an experiment to see if we could change something as difficult as hand washing methods, only with the toughest subjects in all. Kids. So here's what we did. We took 80 munchkins and put them into groups. First, we gave them a challenging puzzle to put together. You know, kind of like the projects you adults are always busy with. Then, we gave the kids a tempting distraction. All up there with our face. Once I see that you guys have put the whole puzzle together correctly, I'll raise my flag, just like this, and then I'll blow my whistle. Okay? And when I do that, you guys can all go and get your cupcake. So what would it take to get these kids to wash their hands? How about a good reason? So one thing you guys should know, there was a sick kid in here playing with the puzzle pieces. He had a runny nose and coughed a lot, so there's probably a lot of germs on him. But there's hand sanitizer over there on the table that you can use to wash up. Okay, which will win out? Delicious frosted cupcakes or the fear of a typhoid toddler? Let's watch. They finish their task. And look, if the threat of one sick kid wasn't enough, just look at all the new germs popping up. <laughs> So with all those good reasons to wash, what do you think they'll do? Okay, so that was a colossal fail. Now, well, at this point, most adults would quit. That's why you just keep changing the year on
on those New Year's resolutions. With the next group of kids, I changed the environment by moving the hand sanitizer closer and then put up a visual cue. This ought to make hand washing easier and more obvious, right? And... In the end, the motivation to not get sick plus changing the environment didn't influence a single kid. Yikes! Next, I increased their ability, which is another source of influence. I had them all complete what is known as deliberate practice, or training, to increase their familiarity with good hand hygiene. Will adding another source of influence get these hand washing offenders to wash up? And... Well, now we're seeing some better results. We're combining three different sources of influence, and some of the kids are actually washing their hands. It looks like we're on the right track. So next, I added another source of influence, social influence. What if somebody spoke up and said something? What would happen if their bosses were in the room with them? Here come the cupcakes. And there goes the flag. Will they wash? No! Look at them pouncing on those cupcakes like a pack of ravenous hyenas. But it's not too late, because something important happens. At just a critical moment, a peer, not even one of the bosses, speaks up. Wash your hands. Watch the effect. Success at last. So social motivation obviously made a difference. But was it the only thing that mattered? What about our other sources of influence? Here's what my kids had to say. <laughs> I was walking over to get my cupcake, but then someone said, wash my, your hands, because this boy has a sniff. So what's the point? We often underwhelm overwhelming problems. We try a couple of things, and when they don't work, we give up. But my dad and his colleagues discovered the secret to overcoming tough problems. You need to combine at least four, preferably more, sources of influence. And it doesn't matter if you try it with kids, or hospitals, at the office, or even at home. If you use four or more sources of influence, your chances for success go up ten times. Ten times! So there it is. The key to changing almost anything is to marshal the power of at least four or more sources of influence, but preferably all six. And heaven knows, we need it. <laughs> pretty, uh, pretty interesting that the default thinking is that, well, we did one of those, right? That should work. We, we educated them. We told them how important it was. Or we put up a sign. Individually, these one-off items on their own do not help. It's, it's the combination or a multi-pronged approach that um, really gets people to change. So this is a summary of those uh, different elements. So you've got a motivation column and then you've got an ability column. So do I know what to do? And do people reinforce that with me? And then do I actually physically know what to do? So I might want to do it, but do I know how to? That's the ability side. And then they look at it from a personal standpoint, a social standpoint, and a structural or design standpoint. So uh, personal would be, so the personal motivation would be how do you motivate an individual, it says, and that's some of the education things. This is why it's important. This is uh, the reason we're asking you to change your behavior. This is the impact it has on the environment. This is the impact it has on your pocketbook. Um, then you look at personal ability. Is this, how, okay, I'm ready to change. Do I know, have the physical tools and training to do that? And maybe I want to change, I just don't know how to get started or what to do. Um, under social motivation, that's, you have people you know that are um, leading by example. So your boss and your friends that you really respect, they are doing those types of behaviors. So you see them exhibiting that behavior. And then um, under social ability is the peer pressure. 
It says, how do we hold each other accountable? It says, not only am I doing it, but when I forget to, my friend called me out on it. Or my coworker says something to me. Or someone else says, hey, where's your um, uh, reusable container? And then the structural motivation would be, what are the motivators outside of personal motivation that can help? Do I get um, rewarded at work for doing the right thing? Is there some financial incentives for doing the right thing? That can help drive my behavior. And then structural ability is uh, taking away some of the barriers. So they move the, the, um, the little dispenser closer to where, they need, where the cupcakes were to try to make it easy. So how do you get rid of any physical barriers or remove anything that is in the way of people doing the right things? So those are the six different aspects that you want to consider when you're trying to make behavior changes. And what they mentioned in the video was that if you can get them to do four or more of those, then you've got a really good shot at actually things will take place and stick. So uh, Recycling Advocates, um, this year our campaign is bring your own coffee cup to the coffee shop. And so we've been thinking through all these different elements and trying to figure out what can we do to help encourage that. You can't just educate people and say, hey, it's going, all this is going to landfill, it's CO2 emissions every time they're making a disposable cup, you can't recycle these. Yeah, that's really good information and it's uh, helpful for people, but that's not enough. All right, so when we started looking at personal motivation, things we started considering was, you know, the impact on the environment. How many cups are we talking about? Is it, um, you know, a thousand cups? Is it a hundred thousand? Our estimates are maybe close to like 50 million cups in Portland a year that are thrown away, coffee cups. Uh, that's a big number. And that kind of gets some shock, shocking results and, and um, gets people to least pay attention a little bit. But that's not enough. So um, how do we get people to be proud about bringing their cups? It's like, yeah, I'm doing the right thing, and I'm, I'm, um, I'm showing it off. It's a, it's a pride thing. Um, and it brings some value. It says, you know, hey, I'm concerned about the environment because I'm carrying this thing around. And it's a little bit of a hassle, but it means something. Maybe we need to give tours to people and take them to the landfill and see where all, this, all, this, all these cups go. And for them to physically kind of in their heads see what's, what happens after they throw things away. Where does it end up? So one of the lean concepts that we do at work is uh, called a dumpster dive, where we actually get people to go through the trash. So when they throw things away, they can actually see all the stuff compiled into one area, and they can go through it, and it's really emotionally um, engaging for them to, to see that. And so anything you can do to bring that problem to the surface and get them physically involved in seeing that can help really get their emotions behind it. How about taking a personal pledge that says, I will no longer use a disposable cup. And so signing their name to a document or going online and filling out a form. So that's something we put on our website was a pledge that says, I'm no longer going to use disposable cups. And it's, it's difficult, but then you know that, hey, I committed to the public or I committed to my friends or my peers that I'm not going to do that. So now I feel like I really need to stick with it. Or just sharing success stories and people's journey and, and sharing how you have gotten to a point where you're bringing your own cup with others. That can help be a motivator for people. So that's the main question that comes out of this particular box would be, do you own or bring your own reusable cup? And uh, that's kind of the step one is, do I have one to bring? And have I gone to that step to, to actually have one? And if not, then maybe that's the first step is, okay, I've decided I'm gonna do this, now what do I need to get the tools to go be able to do that? Then if we go to the personal ability, do I know what cup to bring? You know, does it have to have a lid? Do I know what size the cup is? Will they take any type of cup? If I just bring a little mug in, will they take that? These are all questions that people have that you wanna help give answers to. So they don't, you don't want to give them any reason to say, I, I don't know what to do, so I'm just going to default to whatever the coffee shop gives me. Which locations will accept it? Will every coffee shop accept it? Um, only certain ones? Does it have to be, you know, if it's not perfectly clean, will they still take it? Will they wash it out for me? Those are all the things that come through uh, people of mind. And then what are the questions they need to ask 
when they're going up here. Do you guys have any discount? Do you guys offer, um, can I bring my own, my own cup? Those are things that you can, um, you can get people to ask those questions. Um, so I talked about those. We talked about maybe we should make a video that says, okay, step one is, you know, put your cup into your car or into your, on your bike or in your backpack. And step two is go into the store and say, I have a 16 ounce cup, can you please use this for uh, my coffee? And then um, go step by step through all the details that people might encounter so they can see how it works. Even though it seems like a very simple thing, we're just trying to figure out ways to take away the any kind of ambiguity or any kind of confusion that might come up. And if they don't do it right the first time, it's okay. And say, you know what, that's all right, you're trying. You're not gonna knit, get it right every single time. Yes, you forgot your cup today, no big deal. Versus, well, I screwed up, I didn't do it today, and then I'm just gonna bail on the whole thing. You wanna give them some, give people the support and, and remind them that, hey, this doesn't just switch overnight. And that's okay, so they don't get frustrated. So making sure like they even know what size their cup is. Because that's a common question that says, well, how big a cup is your uh, thing? And they're like, uh, I don't know, uh, just, just give me a regular cup. And people panic and then they, they don't go fall through with it. Under the social motivation, then it's you know calling out people who don't bring their cups. You know, hey, uh, did you bring your cup today? That could be a question we have the coffee shop to ask. Um, it could also be your friends to say, hey, I, I notice every day you bring a disposable. Don't you have a reusable cup? I can give you one if you want. Um, or giving some kind of recognition to the people who are bringing their own cups. And say, hey, good job. I like, I like that cup you brought. Or uh, I see you bring your cup every day. That's awesome. I see that at work. There's a couple people at work that are diehards. So everywhere they go, they've got their cups. And I try to like, you know, say, like, good job. I like, I like what you're doing. So some kind of motivation for them to continue going, even beyond their personal motivation. Um, or remind people and said, well, I don't have my cup with me today. I'm going to go. I'll be right back. And it just kind of highlight the activity that you're doing. It kind of reminds people as well. I also see the um, where just doing the action by yourself, even if you're not saying it or making a big deal out of it, people start to notice. And they pay attention. They're like, yeah, every time he's there, he's got that cup with him. huh?" And it's not like you're, it's kind of subtly um, getting the message out without having to directly confront people about it. So that works very well, in fact. Or having celebrities or other influential people exhibiting that behavior or showing that this is the right thing to do. Um, and then the ultimate thing on this question is, do you think most people bring their own cups? Um, so I'll, I'll throw that out there. What, how many, what percentage of the people do you think bring their own cups to uh, coffee shops here in Portland. How, what percentage? One percent? Any other guesses on that? Thirty percent? I wish it was thirty <laughs> percent. Yeah, Starbucks came out with a thing. This is across all their sites, so it's not Portland specific, but they they report about one to two percent, and they offer a ten cent discount. They sell cups in the store. Uh, they don't really promote it very well, which I think is part of their problem, but. Um, one to two percent is uh, bad. So let's say Portland's better than that and we're at maybe five percent or maybe ten percent. Um, I've taken a little bit of data at some coffee shops and it's it's more around the ten percent or less. So we're probably a little better but we've got a lot of room for opportunity. So we've been playing around with some things with celebrities and trying to figure out okay can we maybe promote the right behaviors with people that are likable that um, are bringing their own cups or drinking out of mugs or um, carrying their own reusable cups around trying to post those or finding people that maybe are a little more uh, confrontational or um, people have a love-hate relationship with um, and showing that they're not doing the right behaviors and uh, again that's whole around the social motivation part it says if you want to be like these people then this is the type of behavior they're doing if you don't want to be like these people then avoid these types of behaviors. So again, one of the six areas we want to focus on. So under the social ability, then maybe it's being a mentor or a coach for somebody that says, you're interested in doing this? Great, let me help you along the way. Tomorrow, meet me at the local coffee shop and bring your cup and we'll both do this together. And you kind of help them through and help them 
um, go through this on their own. One of the things we talked about is how do we get people to bike to work more at work. Maybe you just meet them at their house and say, follow me and we'll go together and I'll show you the bike path you should take. And, th and so you have like someone guiding you or helping you along the way when you get stuck. Who do I turn to to answer my questions? If you have that infrastructure in place, you're more likely to continue because every time you get stuck, you have someone to go to. So having somebody as a mentor or a guide is really powerful. So for us, we're trying to put as much information as we can on our website so they can find that or you know, go to the coffee shops and, and be a resource for them and say, what are the questions that come up? What are people asking about? How do we get that information out there for people? Um, or their friends just says, hey, I've got extra cups if you want one. You know, if, it's, if that's all that's keeping you from doing it, then uh, here I've got a couple at home you can borrow or take. So who do you turn for when you have questions about this type of behavior? So then the structural motivation gets into more of the coffee shop itself. So reusable cup discount. Um, or maybe it's an extra charge or fee on top of it. Most of the places that offer a discount do like a 10%, or sorry, 10 cent discount. Uh, a few do 25 cents, which is good. Um, but most of them are only doing discounts. Uh, they're not like charging extra for disposable, which is interesting. I'll talk on that here in a second. Another way you could do incentivize people is through a punch card system that said every time they bring their cup, you get a punch ticket. And then if you bring your cup, 20 times, that's a free coffee, uh, on top of just being a regular customer. So maybe it's two different punch cards. Um, there's a campaign every year in Portland um, around Earth Month, around April, that, where they do the same kind of thing. is bring your own cup. Then you, every time you get a punch, you can turn it into a, um, into a raffle. And uh, then they draw prizes and give it away. But that's only once a month. So we're trying to figure out how do we build that up so it's all year long. Uh, even the coffee shops are saying, thank you, thanks for bringing your own cup. That's great. Uh, kind of reinforcing that behavior. Um, giving away free stuff or free options when they do that. Or thinking of ways to make the cup more uh, inviting or something that they want to do. Instead of like, oh, I got to drag this around. It's like, I want to design my cup in a way that it's cool and I can show it off to people. And, and it's a source of pride not just something I'm lugging around because I feel obligated to do so. So how do we spin it around and make it a cool thing to do and something they want to do and a motivator? So what other ways to incentivize people to bring their own cups? Those are the things we're thinking about in, in number five here. And then number six is some of the structural ability. So do the coffee shop ask, did you bring your own cup? Even if you didn't bring it, it's kind of like, oh yeah, maybe I should next time. So you start asking the right questions of the behaviors you want to see. Or saying, is this for here or to go? And you're like, uh, I guess I could drink it here. Yeah, that's good. Um, and then going back to the number five, I was just thinking about um, making the experience of drinking the coffee more fun and more rewarding when you're sitting down enjoying it versus taking it to go and in a rushed, chaotic state. And you're trying to go to work and you're walking and drinking your disposable cup. Sit down, relax. Um, have a nice latte with a cool design on the, on the top of it and, and enjoy your time before you head off to your hectic day. Making that more um, appealing to people than just uh, do it for the environment. So back to the ability here. Um, offer the cups for sale in the shop. Can they? So if you don't have a, cu a cup, you can buy one. And then you say, hey, I, I like this shop and I want to you know, promote their um, shop to other people as I'm carrying it around. Or you can have the, some of the shops who try to encourage them to offer uh, ceramic mugs for in-house in use so that they're giving that option to people. So it's not just only disposable or nothing else. Um, also looking at how do you go to work? How do you get to where you're going in the morning? Um, what is the right route to go to the places that support this type of campaign or uh, initiative that make it easy for you to bring your own cup? So, can we get people to figure out which, which, where they should be going that would allow them to hit up these shops that are more conscientious about this? Having cup reminder signs or table tents in the shop itself. So as you come in the, to the store, um, when you're checking in or when you're placing your order, is there anything that reminds you that says, oops, I forgot my cup, I'll be right back, let me go get it. Kind of like the bring your own bag campaign. So, 
I'll touch on that here in a second. Moving the paper cups, the lids and sleeves out of the way and kind of further out of the way. So you're trying to design the space so that it's harder or more of a nuisance to you know, go get the, the lid and the cardboard sleeve, put it in the back corner, way in the back, so people have to walk all the way back there. And eventually they might be frustrated with that and say, all right, I'm just gonna bring my own cup next time. This is a hassle. So things like that are structural things you can do. Um, or make a cleaning station for their cups. It says, here is a little sink in the, in the side here. Wash out your cup. If you, you know, have it in your car and you forgot to clean it last night, or you got it with you, but it's dirty and you're kind of embarrassed. So here's a little cleaning station that makes it easy for you. Then you can clean it up and then you present it to the barista and they, uh, you don't feel so bad. So those are things that are structurally in place to help drive the right behaviors. Um, a lot of the coffee shops are based, based their process based on the size of the cups. So they're used to the disposal, disposable cup sizes and so they fill things up to a certain level. Well, when you bring your own cup, it kind of throws off their system a little bit. And they're like, well, I don't know when to stop now because this is a new cup. So if they can do something on their end to make the process less about the cup and more about how much they're pouring out or uh, stuff that they control versus what the end result is, that could be a design change that helps. Um, goals for the store to achieve a higher cup rate. So is, some, is it something they track? Is there data that they have? Do they review that data and talk about ways that they can make their customers bring their cups more often? Um, stuff that Starbucks had trying to, was trying to go down the path of, they, they set a goal for 5% of their customers and then they kind of said, well, customers are gonna do what they want. And they basically, the way I was reading it, they kind of gave up on that goal. So that's a little disappointing, but I don't, you know, if you look at what they do, they, there's a lot of opportunity they could increase that with the right questioning. There's a lot, of, did you know that uh, Starbucks has their own ceramic in-house mugs that you can get? Um, they don't tell you about that. It's all set up for disposable cups. So if you say, I like it for here, they will give you a ceramic cup. They just don't tell you that. So it's things like that, that they're, you know, there's opportunities there. Or maybe it's a fast lane at the coffee shop that says, you know, reusable mugs over here in this line, and it's a shorter line and it goes through quicker. So you're standing in the line for the disposable cup and you see three people come by past you and they're out the door already. Tomorrow I'm probably gonna bring my own cup because I can see that the benefit there and they've structured the, the system to encourage me to do the right thing. So taking away the reasons or making it as simple as possible to do the right thing. So those are the different pieces they talked about in the influencer model. And so as we've gone through and talked about this, these are some of the ideas we're trying to give the coffee shops and ways we're trying to put together our verbiage and our materials to kind of um, address some of those issues. Yeah, question? Yeah. So you're saying that the, uh, there are certain cups that will hold the heat longer and give them a better drinking experience. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great, um, great idea. We should add it in there because, yeah, it's and kind of like the sitting down and enjoying the coffee. That's a, a positive that you can have out of this. It. Not something like, oh, I have to bring my cup around and kind of a nuisance. This is a positive thing. It makes it a better experience. Great. So this is a study that was done at Tufts University and. What they end up doing was charging customers for disposable cups. And so usually, the, the, most people, they just offer discounts. Um, here they actually charge, and you can see that when they went to a um, 10 cent discount, it got 3% um, of the people brought their cups. When they made it a charge on the bill, and there's on this menu you can see where they added in a charge for disposable cups. You can see that it uh, was more than double the number of people. It's still only 8%, but that was a, that's a pretty big improvement from 3% just by making people pay extra. So even if it's the same amount, 10 cent discount versus 10 cent charge, it changes the thought of people have. I don't want to pay extra for something, but 10 cents isn't really a motivator for a lot of people to, to change behaviors. It's like, eh, it's just 10 cents. But when it's like, you're going to charge me 10 cents? That's crazy. Um, all of a sudden people actually change. They don't like being charged for stuff. So 
it's a little risky for the shops because they are now charging people for what some other shops are not charging for. So it's probably it will make it hard for them to adopt this type of approach unless we can do something like citywide or statewide where it's, everything gets uh, charged a fee. And so everyone's in the same playing field. But it definitely helps. So here's a couple other things with why fees versus discounts is, is better. So again, one to two percent of Starbucks customers, they receive a 10 cent, 10 cent discount, but they really don't really promote some of these other things that they're doing. The Irish government imposed a 15 uh, euro or 13 cent tax on plastic bags. And then within two years, there was a 94 percent reduction in plastic bag consumption because people were being charged for the bag. So that worked pretty well. San Jose realized 47% decrease in waste and 158% increase in recyclables after instituting a pay per throw program. So you paid by how much you uh, threw away. And so again, now you're being charged directly. And today, you throw stuff away, it's all kind of the same price whether you give a whole container full or very minimal. There's no incentive financially to do the right thing. And then there's a five, um, is that, uh, oh, pounds. Yeah, five pounds or US, uh, eight US dollars. They charge people to drive in central London dur certain, during certain congestion times. And it reduced 30% of the congestion and 16% of the overall traffic when they impose this fee to drive in the middle of town, uh, especially like during the day. So the fees have a much more powerful impact than a discount or a reduction in price. So again, the timing of when the reminders come is important as well. So if you have a got your bags um, little reminder sticker on your window, before you leave your vehicle, you're, you're more likely to see that and remember to bring it with you. The next best, uh, best option would be, it's a reminder sign in the parking lot where you park. That's a little sign that says, you know, don't forget your bags. And then kind of the last effort, but it's still somewhat effective is at the checkout line, you know, did you bring your bags? Well, you're kind of pretty late in the game right there. So maybe some people will quick run out and grab it, but most of the time it's probably too late. So you'll see some improvement at that point of the, of the process, but the further up you can get it to a point of maybe this sign needs to be at your house before you leave. And it's uh, the sign going out that says, don't forget your bags. Uh, that would be the ideal place to have it. The point of when you can make the decision quickly and change your behaviors versus at the very end of the line and people are behind you, you're kind of like, I ah, forget, it, I'll just get the regular bags. So timing makes a difference as well. And that wouldn't be most effective. Here's some other examples I thought were pretty good. They use humor, you know, hey, um, we're trying to get the fish to stop smoking, so don't leave your cigarette butts out there. So kind of spin it instead of it being, you know, there's gonna be a fine and $5 penalty or $50 fine if we catch you smoking. They're trying to use some humor to try to get people to, you know, change their behaviors and not be so um, direct and confrontational. Or we make it a competition that says, who's your favorite team? And put your recyclables in the right bin and then we'll keep track and see who's really the, the biggest fans. And then people will probably go out of their way to find recyclables just to throw in their favorite team's slot. So again, trying to use competition or, uh, or humor to try to get people to think about the problem in a different way. So here's a couple other tips um, I wanted to highlight that this came out of a book called Switch. Uh, it's a good book I'd recommend. And I'll tell you a couple other books that I found pretty useful. First thing would be reduce the number of choices. So like they've gone through on single stream recycling, it's recycling, everything goes into one container. So um, that has a lot of advantages from the individual side. They don't have to think about, is this compost? Is this metal? Is this paper, which bin do I put it in? I'm not sure, I'm confused, I'll just throw it away because I, I don't know what to do. So if you can move to something simpler and take away the choices, it's easier and you're gonna get more adoption of that behavior change. Mistake-proof the changes. So um, one thing we talked about with how do we get people to shut off devices before they leave their office. Maybe we have one power strip that they plug all the devices that they want to shut off at the end of the day and then it's just click one button and everything powers down. Versus I gotta flip off my monitor, then I'm gonna reach back, turn on my phone charger, unplug my charger, go over here, 
unplug my little fan, turn off my space heater, you know, then it's more hassle and it's harder to do. So how do you simplify that? Another project we worked on was uh, um, getting people to uh, embrace a setback program at work where we turn down the temperature during the winter at night and we let the temperature rise up in the summer at odd working hours, like overnight and weekends. And so we gave this override button, which basically allowed people to press that button and get two hours of the normal temperature range. And so that really helped adopt, get people to uh, embrace the change we promoted because they had this backup plan or a fail safe that says, if I'm here in an odd time and I don't like the temperature, I can always press that button. And that helped get people to want to do the change because they had this other option available. Um, appealing to the emotional side, I kind of touched on that with the dumpster dive or waste audit, is getting people to actually get involved and engage and physically get their hands and see what's going on versus I throw something away and it's, it disappears into, into, uh, into the black hole somewhere. But actually get them hands on. Let's go to the landfill and let's go to the transfer station. Let's actually see what's going on. That's very emotional. Give them a head start. So one of the things they promoted is if you have like a punch card program, give them two or three punches on the first one. It's like, oh, I'm already partway started versus you give them a blank one and they look at it and said, well, I'm starting from scratch. Or if you give them just maybe two punches, it's like, hey, I'm already on the right track. I'm already 20% of the way done to my free coffee. And so you, you've given them kind of a nice head start on that incentive. Um, Focus on the very first behavior change. So what is the thing that, that needs to happen first? And most people, for bringing their own cup, it's getting their cup out of their house and with them. And if they can at least bring it with them, that's 90% of the battle. Um, once they have it with them, they're more likely to go get it or bring it with them or it's right, it's close by to them versus they keep forgetting to put it in their car or bring it with them in their bag. So focus them on what is the very first thing they have to do, step one. If you get them doing that, the rest of the steps are a lot easier. Look for success stories um, or um, opportunities when the individual has done the right behavior. So um, a lot of the discussion, uh, uh, my wife and I are vegan, and so one of the things that um, we try to highlight to people is you've eaten vegan before, you just didn't know it. You know, the other day when we had that lunch came in, that was actually a vegan meal. And they're like, oh, really? I had no idea. So highlight and promote the times that they've done the right behavior that you're asking of them to do. Said, I saw you bring in your cup the other day, you know, that was, uh, or I saw you refill that water bottle you had. Okay, that's kind of a form of reusing your, your own cup uh, and highlight that, hey, you've already done these behaviors. This isn't brand new stuff. This is things you've, you've been successful on before. You have had meals without meat before. It's not impossible. So every time that they have done the right behavior, hi bring, highlight it and make sure they realize that they did that. Um, and then encourage people along the way. So a lot of times, even if you have like some kind of incentive program or punch card system, if you wait to the very end to, to acknowledge that they're doing the right thing, sometimes they're not gonna ever get to the end. But if you like give them status or progress along the way, it says, hey, you've made it halfway through there. Great job, here's a free, um, you know, free flavor shot added to your next cup. Something to kind of keep them motivated as they're working towards a longer goal or a mission. So, don't make it an all or nothing thing, that they have to get to the very end before they get any kind of recognition for what they're doing. How do we get them partially there and reward them along the way? Uh, checklists are good to do. Um, a reminder of every day before I leave my work, here are the things I need to shut off. Or before I leave my, my home, here are the things I need to have in my car. I need my phone, I need my chargers, I need my work badge, I need my uh, laptop, I need uh, my workout clothes and you have a little checklist that you remind look over every day before I go on a trip Here are the things that I need to pack in my bag to make sure that I'm um, Not forgetting something do I have my passport do I have blah 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 and you just check it off and It's very simple once you're done. You're like good I don't have to think about it anymore because I've already thought through this checklist I don't have to think and, and stress about the rest of the day. What am I forgetting? I think I feel like I'm missing something uh, So checklists are awesome there's a book called The Checklist Manifesto that really kind of hammers on why that's so critical. Provide very detailed instructions. So one of the things they went through was um, how to do a, they were trying to collect uh, can donations. And so they did two different groups. One was like, hey, take your cans to this location on campus. 
And then the other group, they said, get on the bus, the number 14 bus, ride it downtown, get off there, walk 300 yards, go into the building on your left, go up to the second floor, and then take a right, and then you'll see a blue container there, and that's where you drop your cans off. Guess which one got better results for people? Even against people's predictions based on their past behavior, but that person's really environmental friendly, they'll, they'll show up and donate. That person, will, I guarantee that person won't show up, but they saw that um, the people that didn't think would show up showed up when they got very, very detailed instructions, and they could almost envision what was gonna happen and they actually then kind of planned it out that, all right, I'll go right after class. And that was the other part of it. They said, you know, what's your schedule look like today? Well, I have a class from 1030 to 1130. Okay, after the 1130 class, then you could go donate your hands. So they've already kind of laid out the scenarios from their, in their minds and made it super easy for them to do it. Um, there's, a web, uh, there's a search engine called Ecosia. I think that's how you pronounce it. Is anyone familiar with that? But every time you do a search on there, they donate a tree, and they plant a tree. And so what that website does is once you download that, it actually overrides your browser default search engine options. So you can do that on your phone or on your laptop or computer. And so they've made it easy so you don't have to go to that website to do it. All the search buttons and fields are all connected to that website. So. Uh, not only doing the right thing, but then it makes it easy instead of like, oh, I forgot, to, I started at Google and I forgot to go to Ecosia. So they, they figure out a way to basically take over your little search engine functionality, and so it automatically goes to the website you want them to search. So that, that's a pretty cool little tool or app. Have people practice the new behavior, so that was in the video, they showed people how to actually wash their hands. So that's something that's very important. Often we think that people will get it and they know what to do, but you need to walk them through the steps, make sure that they actually can do it. So verify that they can do it. Or if you ask someone, hey, before you leave, make sure you turn on your computer. Well, let me watch you and observe you, make sure you know how to actually do that. So we just make that assumption, but we find out that maybe it's the training that's lacking. And like I said before, be the change. So um, every time we have a meal at work, uh, people start asking, what are you eating? And why don't you eat meat? And it leads to this discussion around eating vegan. And um, or why do you? Where'd you get that plate from? Well, I brought it with me. And, and so I'm not initiating the discussion, but they're seeing the behavior and they're asking questions and are inquisitive about where did you get that and why did you bring that? And that seems to be very powerful, even though I'm kind of passively doing that. Um, so when they're bringing up the idea or suggesting it or inquiring about it, then it seems more powerful. So those are some of the other tips that were in this book. Anyone else have any uh, other tips they've thought of or things that they've seen that works really well they want to share? Or Nothing else, we hit most of the, the things that seem to work really well. Okay, these are a couple of good books I recommend. One is called uh, Fostering Sustainable Behavior. Talks about the community-based social marketing program. Uh, again, it gives a lot of good tips and ideas on how to make people do the right things for the environment and have more sustainable behaviors. Nudge is another program or another book that talks about uh, how do we not make people or, or force people to do the right thing, but how do we kind of make it easy by nudging them in the right direction? And so it's almost easy. And, and like one of the some of the examples I'll give are, is around signing up for programs and basically setting it up so it defaults to that they're gonna to go to the most uh, preferred method and they have to opt out of doing something that's doing the right behavior. They have to opt out of it. So um, kind of influencing people without forcing them to do things. But having a, like a default set in place so if they don't do anything, it, it reverts to their most uh, preferred method. Whether it's signing up for a program or a like they were talking about a, um, a workplace uh, donation program or a investment program, a 401k program, is defaulting that you're gonna sign up unless you decide to opt out of it. Because a lot of people just don't get around to doing things. Drive is uh, another good book and Switch is the one I talked about briefly. So all those are good. And th they talk about generic examples, not just about environmental stuff, but most of them can be applied to that. Okay, so in summary, um, education and appealing to people about the environment is not enough. Just telling them, hey, I gave them all the facts, 
they know how harmful this is to the environment, yet they continue to do that. It's not a big surprise because it's not enough. That is just one piece of those six influence areas you have to consider. So again, uh, learn and study what works. Do some research on um, things that have worked and are effective. And you'll, some, you'll be surprised at some of the things that are uh, actually working the best. And a lot of times it gets away from the education. It's more about emotions and peer pressure and just systems that drive the right behavior. So leverage the influencer model and try to identify and have in place at least four sources of those six. If you get that, then the success and implementation rate goes up tremendously. And don't get caught up in the solution so much. So once you identify that there's a problem you want to solve, don't get hung up on it needs to be this solution. So fall in love with the problem, but don't get fall in love with what the solution looks like because you want to find a solution that's effective and don't get wrapped up and I want it to be this solution. So bring, so our problem is we have disposable cups. We're gonna, um, we want people to reduce the number of disposable cups, but if the solution is we, um, you know, something that isn't bringing your own cup, we should be open to that and say, whatever's gonna work, we don't care. Um, this is just the starting point. We'll learn from it and we'll adjust as needed. But if we are hit dead set on sticking with bring your own cup and it's not working, it's gonna fail. So we need to be passionate about the problem, but we shouldn't care too much about the solution. We wanna be find stuff that's effective. So keeping that in the back of your mind is very important as well. So any of those ideas appeal to you or things you think might help with some of the things you're working on or influence you're trying to make? Did I give you enough things to think about or ideas? And I can email this presentation if you want. You can uh, send me your, uh, I've got contact information here. Um, so you can connect me at LinkedIn or you can send me an email or you can visit, if you want to learn more about the Coffee Cup program, you can go to the Recycling Advocates website and we have uh, information about our campaign there. Does anyone have any other questions or thoughts? That's all I had for today. Thanks for coming.